Apologies, everybody. I ended that video a little too short. I meant to pause it and then resume it. And when I tried to resume it, I said I was done. So I ended that video and now I'm gonna pick up where we left off with exercise number two. So again, we're on page 82 here, finding the average rate of change for both of these functions over these intervals. Okay, so we have f of x equals 5x plus 7, and g of x equals 2x squared plus 1. So we're given these domain intervals, these x intervals, which means we have our inputs, right, from one end to the other end of the interval. Those are our x inputs. That will give us our change in the input. But in order to find the change in the output, we have to figure out what are the outputs for these given inputs. So we have to do some function evaluation here. Now I'm going to start with my f of x. So I want to first evaluate f of x for negative 2. Now I'm not going to show the process of substituting to evaluate because we've done that so many times before. So I'm just going to skip a couple steps. But when I evaluate negative 2 here, I get an output of negative 3. When I evaluate for x equals 3, f of 3, I get an output of 22. Okay, so now I have my f of x inputs, negative 2 and 3, and I have those outputs. So I want to do the change in f over the change in x. So my function ended at 22, but started at negative 3. Okay, so I, this was my second output, 22 minus negative 3. So another place where I will say, be careful of your negatives. Because when you're using the average rate of change formula, you're always subtracting. So if we're subtracting a number that's negative, we technically end up adding. 22 minus negative 3 over 3 minus negative 2. Which that comes out to be 25 over 5, which gives an average rate of change for, function, for our f function of 5 over that interval. All right, well now let's figure out g. So I do g of negative two. So I'm evaluating g of x for negative two, which two times negative two squared, that's gonna give me nine. And I have g of three, which equals 19. Okay, again, I cut out the steps of showing the substitution but those are your outputs for those given inputs using g of x. So just like I did here, the change in f over change in x to get that average rate of change. Well, now I'm working with my g of x function. So I would do the change in g over the change in x. So now that will be 19 minus 9 over 3 minus negative 2 comes out to be 10 over 5, which is 2. Okay, so the average rate of change for f of x on the interval from negative 2 to 3 is 5, but the average rate of change for g of x from the interval negative 2 to 3 is 2. So f of x is changing faster on that first interval, right? Well, now we're going to find the average rate of change over this interval to see a little bit more of what's going on inside these functions. Okay, so same thing here. I'm going to do first f of 1, which is 12, and f of 5, which is 32. So now I have my two outputs for my given inputs. Remember, these inputs came from the ends of our intervals. Because we know our interval starts at 1 and ends at 5, so what's happening in between? 
I'm finding out how fast it's changing here. So change in F over change in X equals 32 minus 12 over 5 minus 1. Which comes out to be 20 over 4, which equals 5. Hmm. Where else did we get something that equaled 5? separate this here okay now again I need to do my g of x because this is the average rate of change for f of x over that interval so now I do g of 1 which equals 3 and g of 5 oops, which equals 51 now again to find that average rate of change, take my change in G over the change in X, 51 minus 3 over 5 minus 1. It was 48 over 4, which equals 12. So what do we notice here? A couple things that we should notice. Okay, that or here, this is what I was looking for. The change in F, or that average rate of change, not just the change in F, but we took into account the X interval. So that average rate of change for F of X in our first interval was five. The average rate of change for F of X in our second interval was also five. So the average rate of change in those two intervals was the same for F of X. But what about G of X? Well, our first interval, that average rate of change was 2. The second interval, that average rate of change is 12. So G of X is changing a lot faster in this interval than it did in that first interval. Our next question relates directly to that. It says the average rate of change for F was the same in both 1 and 2 here, but it was not the same for G. So why is that? Why, oh, why is that? Hmm. Well, notice what kinds of functions those, those were that we were working with. F of X equals 5X plus 7 is what kind of function? And G of X equals 2X squared plus 1. Again, what kind of function is that? Well, f of x would be linear. g of x is quadratic. And what do we know about linear functions? What do we know about linear functions? Y is a line perfectly straight. But a quadratic is a U-shaped, which curves. So why is a line perfectly straight? Well... Linear functions, something I hope a lot of us remember from Algebra 1, linear functions have a constant rate of change. Also known as a constant slope, which gives that line a perfectly straight look. A line is perfectly straight. That's just one of the characteristics of a line. And it's perfectly straight because it has a constant slope, a constant rate of change. No matter what x interval you're looking at, that linear function will have the same slope in every interval. That is not true for a quadratic function, as we can see from our work here. Okay, depending what interval you look at on a quadratic function, that will be changing a lot faster or a lot slower than other intervals. Okay? Maybe not even a lot faster or a lot slower. It could just be a little bit. But a quadratic function does not have a constant rate of change. But linear functions do. And maybe another thing some of you guys may have noticed. If this was it, well, it is y equals mx plus b form. So that 5 is in the place of m, which that is our slope. m represents the slope or that rate of change. 
So whatever that is in a linear function, that will always be what you would compute for the average rate of change. And again, beauty of math right there. You've seen it for yourself, seen it firsthand with your own eyes. You've heard it with your own ears. That's how linear functions work. And that's how you compute average rate of change. All right. So I will hope that that is good information to get you guys started here, get you ready to tackle those fluency questions and the application question and the reasoning question, which of course we'll talk about next time. But it doesn't hurt to get a jump start on those. Okay, so thank you guys. See you next time.